Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Nine South South Forum on Sustainability. The theme is the collapse of modern civilization and the future of humanity. Since 2011, the, uni the Global University for Sustainability has organized the South South Forum on Sustainability. We aim to bring together thinkers and actors predominantly from the South, but also from the North for a dialogue and exchange on two key areas of concern, alternative development and ecological sustainability, putting a focus on articulating and understanding experience on the ground, especially relatively autonomous self-managing local units and their interdependent networking and relations of mutuality. We recognize and value the large pool of existing efforts, resources and convergency and aim at adding to cross-border exchanges in the endeavor for the formation of new historical subjects for cultural and social change for another possible world. Today, Professor Petro Pais will deliver a lecture on techno-feudalism, new financial architect, food and debt crisis. We invite Professor Aridem Banjari from India and Professor Mauricio de Souza Sabadini from Brazil to be discussants. We provide English, Portuguese, Spanish, and Chinese simultaneous interpretation. You can find a group icon of interpretation at the bottom of your computer screen. We would like to thank today's interpreters, uh, Julia Ruz Gi Giovanni and Melina Hevada, Melissa Rufani, and Julieta Mendez, Huang Xiaomei, and Li Monghong. May I first introduce the co-moderators for today's session. My name is Sitchoy Jadi Margaret. I am Associate Professor at the Rural Revitalization Strategy Research Institute, Southwest University, China. I am board member of Asian Regional Exchange for New Alternatives, based in Hong Kong, China and a founding member of Global University for Sustainability. I have been actively involved in the rural reconstruction movement in China for over two decades. Uh, Tong Yi Kao uh, is a member of ARENA and a research fellow at the Center of Cultural Research and Development at Lingnan University in Hong Kong, China. He was previously an impact postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Anthropology at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, he has a PhD in social anthropology from SOAS London in 2019, and also obtained a PhD in cultural studies uh, from Lingnan University in Hong Kong in 2014. Prior to this, he had training in economics, political economy, and sociology in Australia and the United States. He is a founding member of the Global University for Sustainability and also an edit editorial board member of the of uh, the colonial uh, subversions. Now I pass the floor to Tong Yi. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Pedro Paez Perez. Uh, who was a former Minister of Economy of Ecuador uh, from 2007 to 2008. He was also the Deputy Minister of Finance in 2006 and a Superintendent of Market Power Control uh, between 2012 to 2017. He was also a plenipotentiary presidential delegate for the new financial architecture negotiations that took place between 2007 and 2011. He had pre and postgraduate professor at several universities in Ecuador and abroad. Um, th this includes uh, the University of Utah, Sorbonne, um, and he was the former chair of the Economic Research Institute at the Pontifical Catholic University of Ecuador. He's currently an independently uh, independent analyst. Um, I, I suppose I will introduce the discussions uh, when Dr. Perez has finished his presentation. So without further ado, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Perez. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, let me start with a congratulation to the team that has uh, prepared these uh, wonderful uh, uh, journeys of, uh, of discussion about the, 
the global situation. This is indeed a, a very crucial point in terms of civilization. And we need to deploy all type of eff efforts in order to have a conscience and organization among the peoples in the world to avoid uh, a catastrophe. Um, as uh, a, you can ask me, I'm going to talk about the situation in Latin America, but this is not enough to talk about the uh, conjuncture in Latin America, but Latin America in the conjuncture, in the global conjuncture. So uh, we are going to discuss, discuss some of the basic uh, endogenous forces that are uh, sending the, uh, the, the globe to, the, to this um, uh, uh, very dire situation. Uh, because uh, as uh, Ballerstein uh, told us, uh, humanity faces today a historical bifurcation, either a superior mode of life, more humane, fair, and ecological, based upon the democracy and uh, the democratization of the technical progress, or uh, to a degraded and long agony of capitalists adopting archaic forms of exploitation and domination. That is why we need to we need to to go into the details of the let me let me try to to share the the screen. Sorry, I have to restart my computer. That is why I have everything prepared, but something was very wrong with it. The global oligarchical agenda has transformed weakness into strength. We are not talking about the crisis of capitalism, but also the capitalism of crisis. So they had a, a deployed the, the destructive forces of the crisis towards the um, uh, enemies of the uh, Anglo-American hegemony, and more specifically, the enemies or the rivals in the competitive uh, realm of the uh, uh, monopolic speculative capital. So uh, the structural crisis of overproduction, overproduction of merchandises and uh, capital, more specifically in this uh, epoch, uh, fictitious capital, uh, has created a, a, a a huge uh, agenda, a, a civilizatory agenda against the peoples in the world. The determinant pole remains in production, but the dominant pole is clearly in the monetary financial sphere. That is why it need an urgent new financial architecture at the global level, at the regional level, but also at the domestic level. The recent events in the uh, Ukraine crisis has showed us uh, how effective are the uh, deployment of uh, the deployment of instruments in the uh, economic warfare uh, in the uh, monetary and financial sphere. Uh, we need to the link not only in terms uh, the linking the sense of Samir Amin's uh, proposition, not only in terms of trade, in terms of production but also in this dominant sphere of a, 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 a technical measures of war against the peoples. We need to work then in the immediate responses to this uh, speculative oligarchical agenda, uh, at least with two basic uh, uh, vectors. The first one is a global mobilization against the new food crisis, and the second one is the global mobilization against the new debt crisis. In both ve vectors, Latin America plays a very crucial role as a victim, as a, an object of the agenda of the hegemon in decline. Uh, in terms of the global mobilization against the new uh, food crisis, we need to go into, so in terms of the global mobilization, we need to prevent the most vulnerable uh, nations in Latin America uh, against, uh, thank you. Let's go the second, uh, the second slides, please. Especially uh, countries like uh, Haiti, for example. We need to prevent the possibility of a new uh, 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 warfare against the population 
uh, Haiti has been in uh, uh, has been the victim of the aggression during the last decades uh, due to the rebellion of the people, the permanent rebellion of the people. So we need to uh, deploy a global mobilization against this type of issues, uh, eliminate in, uh, 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 demanding the elimination of any logistic, trade, and financial restriction uh, in terms of the food supply. Uh, that includes the restrictions and the sanctions in the. Can you see the? Can you see now the 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 screen, please? Yes, yes, we can see it. Ah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, okay. I, I had some problems with this. Okay, um, the new the, the second the second important uh, uh, feature is that you we need to demand the new emissions of the special growing rights, SDRs, both for the financial the financing of each country's needs and for the financing of the worldwide mechanism to fight the crisis opening the door for a series of global commons solution for humanity as a whole to be followed by health, ecological, poverty, immigration, peace, etc. goals. That means Latin America is part of the global uh, agenda from the perspective of the peoples to uh, fight for, to open the doors for another type of fight around the uh, a, a global common good, global common goods. So this a, a emergent task for the uh, next uh, few months should be transformed in a whole task for the countries, but also for the organizations, the global movements uh, around uh, the solution of the of the humanities problems against that than the agenda of the uh, uh, great reset and the the globalist. Uh, and the third one, of course, there is a lot of a lot of issues there. But the, the third, the third one, and not the least, is the global ban of derivatives and any speculative instruments, dismantling the restriction in terms of the international intellectual property and patent impositions, including the WTO and the IPWO commitments, at least in the food value chain. The second, the second one is the global mobilization against the debt crisis. This is the new one because they are repeating exactly the same recipe that uh, it was very successful in the, at the end of the 70s, at the beginning of the 80s, in order to submit not only Latin America, but the global South and even the uh, uh, East European countries. Um, the, that includes the global restructuring mechanism for sovereign debt, based upon real payment capabilities and the injection of real investment for development, ecological care and poverty reduction. Second, the global mechanism for independent debt audits, like what we did in Ecuador in 2008, for detection of illegitimate and odious debt to be repudiated. Third, the policy space construction, dismantling all the free trade agreements, the tax havens, the tax evasion mechanisms and the global institutions like the free trade agreements, the uh, 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 investment protection treaties, et cetera, et cetera. Global and regional SDRs, global and regional currencies, digital currencies like the Sucre, the, 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 the regional system of uh, unitary uh, uh, payments that we uh, in, try to, to de develop in, in Latin America the past decade uh, within a block regional financial monetary arrangement for a multipolar reconstruction of productive and social capabilities, including new types of development banks, a new type of payment system, and the new type of defensive stability funds. This is for my friends. This is nothing new. I've been uh, fighting for this the last two decades. And uh, uh, at least in Latin America, we have a temporary setback, but uh, the crisis and the development of the situation has uh, triggered a, a, a spontaneous uh, a, a, a deployment of different type of, of, of the types of initiatives around this, this uh, a, a paths. A, the most recent crisis in Ukraine, the, the payment in, in national currencies of the trade between uh, uh, Russia and Turkey, Russia and India, or the, the conversations between China and, uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia uh, had uh, put 
the the finger in the in the in the in the in the problem that has has, has pointed the point over the the uh, the eyes. We have now the the huge possibility of transforming the correlation of forces uh, precisely because in the monetary and financial sphere has created these new conditions. Uh, just to make a, a, an illustration here, uh, uh, in the case of Russia, uh, the, the, the transformation of the matrix of payments could uh, represent at most uh, two, three percent of the global uh, transactions. But in the case of China, 93 percent of the uh, imports and 93 percent of the exports and 95 percent of the imports are denominated right now in dollars or euros. Any change in the percentage of in the in the in the in the in the, in the uh, redemption of this uh, subrepresentation of the Chinese uh, currency in the international market could transform the capabilities of deployment. For example, of the uh, uh, almost uh, 1,000 real uh, military bases of the United States around the world, because the acceptability of the dollar as the monopoly of transactionality. Uh, liquidity, uh, credit is going to be weakened by this type of uh, uh, very, uh, between quotes, uh, easy transformations. In the case of Latin America, uh, President Lula uh, has promised again the possibility, the, 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 the effort of a, a, a continental currency in Latin America. This is nothing new. In 2007, in December 2007, President Lula, uh, with the six other uh, uh, presidents of Latin America, of South America, had signed uh, an agreement about the Banco del Sur uh, and the new regional financial architecture that included precisely this, this type of arrangements, a new type of development bank, a new type, type of payment system, and, and a new type of defensive stability funds. The problem is that immediately, um, a lot of voices, uh, uh, unfortunately, among them uh, very conspicuous uh, voices from the uh, heterodox camp uh, in economics and in, in sociology, uh, the academia, has, uh, had started to, to, to talk about the euro. The Latin American design has nothing to do with the euro. This is a, a, a abomination. We need to create a, first a, 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 a strong uh, space of sovereignty at the, at the national level, and then to create a new space of sovereignty, a new realm of decisions in terms of the supranational level, in terms of the integration of the Patria Grande and the integration of Latin America with the uh, construction of these new uh, instruments of defense in this uh, uh, global uh, economic warfare. Uh, we are going to go into the details of this because we need to uh, understand first how uh, crucial is this, are these type of instruments uh, in the, in the uh, conditions of, of the uh, global uh, and systemic crisis of capitalism. So we need to understand, first of all, the global pressures on profitability, the counter tendencies, the accumulation regime, and the structural crisis. Uh, these uh, statistics about the secular trend for the fell falling rate of profit can show you how the efforts of capitalism, of uh, the anti-entropic efforts of capitalism, had uh, built up new accumulation regimes in order to uh, uh, solve, at least temporarily, the problems of uh, profitability uh, in, the, uh, in the global level. These are not ex ante micro uh, trends, but those are emergent characteristics of the system uh, that uh, have created a, a, a spectrum of uh, non-reversible a, a mutations of capitalism that we can call accumulation regimes. Um, those are not technical issues. We are precisely in this uh, bifurcation, historical bifurcation, uh, in terms of those difficulties of capitalism. Uh, previously, we had uh, this, uh, for example, this is, uh, we cannot see this, in, is a, a, after the, the 1929 crisis, 
we have uh, the, the transformation of the uh, monopolic liberal uh, uh, regime of accumulation into the Fordist Keynesian regime of accumulation. And that was very fine because it increased the possibilities of both for workers in terms of uh, distribution, but also for the uh, 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 capitalist as, uh, as a global class. In, the, in red, you can see which is the share of profits into the GDP of the United States. But what was decisive was not the, the, the collective, the, the impossible collective class of capitalists, but the decision of the oligarchy that you can see the stagnation of the share of the profits that goes to the 200 uh, largest corporations in the United States. Let's, we, let's call this the oligarchy. So that provoked the change from the Fordist Keynesian uh, regime of accumulation to the financialized regime of accumulation. Uh, and now we have the, the last uh, 20 years, we have another stagnation in the, in the blue uh, arrow you can see the stagnation of the share of the oligarchical part. Uh, and this is done against the interest, not only of the, of the global South, not only of uh, the working classes, but also against the, the interest of the uh, capitalist class as a whole. This is an inter uh, uh, bourgeois uh, struggle for power. And that is what triggers the uh, uh, transformations, the internal mutations of capitalism that could profile the new type of accumulation regimes. Now we have the uh, 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 petering out of the most uh, important vectors of the, the transformation of the financialized uh, accumulation regime, the gap between the wage share and the consumption share that was a, a solved between quotes uh, with the uh, indebtedness, the over indebtedness of the uh, households, but also of the enterprises and the governments. And the other one is the gap between the profit share and the investment share. Uh, before that, we have in during the Keynesian for this accumulation regime, uh, the higher the profits, the higher the productive investment. Now we have a um, uh, uh, dissociation between the uh, uh, accumulation uh, dynamics and the, the productive accumulation dynamics and the profit share. And the gap has been filled by a financial speculative accumulation. Latin America and the Global South, we are the objects of these uh, uh, transformations in a subordinated financialization. So globalization is the reproduction of the subordinated role of our economies, not only in terms of an equal exchange and an equal production, but also a subordination in terms of center periphery relationships of financing and monetary issues. So the hierarchy of money and the hierarchy of financial uh, instruments like the interest rate, for example, and the, the, the subsumption uh, of, of, of trade and the balance of payments in terms of the logic of speculation and uh, the logic of uh, short-termism short uh, in, in, the, in the financial accumulation uh, has created specific, specific uh, weakness, specific fragility in terms of the macroeconomic uh, uh, management of our economies. So the financialization crisis and structural uh, mutations of the capitalist mode of production uh, has, uh, has been, uh, should be understood in terms of the, not only in terms of the description, but also in terms of the internal forces of this situation, where the capitalist mode of production is going. So Carlota Perez and other uh, new Schumpeterian economists sustain that as the beginning of each scientific technological revolution requires considerable financing of uh, new fixed capital compulsorily required by ferocious competition, Konratiev ascending phases impulse financialization up to the point of diffusion of the new technology after which 
productive capital becomes dominant. The problem is that we are in a continuous revolution, technological revolution since the 60s. And the, pro and the, the, the point is that the traditional Keynesian uh, mechanisms of uh, profitability are not working now because the pace of uh, innovation uh, uh, prevents the amortization of fixed capital uh, 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 fully because we have a new innovation that uh, renders the previous technology obsolete, moral obsolescence. Uh, so the problem of uh, internal endogenous financiarization is embedded in the rhythm of uh, in technological innovation. Arigi stresses Brodel's assessment about financiarization of the declining turn in the sequential hegemonies in world systems. So the decline of the Anglo-American uh, hegemony uh, in descriptive terms could be understood precisely in terms of this uh, 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 endogenous forces of uh, financialization. This time is different. A combination of a long and continuous scientific technological revolution with Anglo-American hegemony have defined a crisis of civilization based upon financialization and more so speculation that has evolved into what Varoufakis, Brenner, among others, identify as neo-techno feudalism, feudalism. Latin America is the receiving part of the situation. We are not policy makers. We are not cycle makers. We are cycle takers. We are policy takers. And we need to defend ourselves with a, a foundational insubordination and then a, a foundational uh, 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 constituent process in terms of the real capabilities of defense. So, Senal capitalism, neo-feudalism, and the degradation of civilization are the main challenges that Latin America have to face. Bolivar Echeverria, uh, uh, Ecuadorian uh, philosopher during the 70s, had uh, foreseen the uh, transformation <coughs> of uh, capitalism from the extraordinary profits for innovation to rent-seeking technology. So, the internal forces of innovation has been delocalized, has been uh, decentered uh, from the logic of competition uh, as it was with capitalism uh, in, the, in the decades before the 70s to a rent-seeking uh, technology. And uh, the transformation or the subsumption of the uh, innov technological innovation in the, in the very, very narrow parts that had been uh, deployed uh, commercially into a situation of, of, uh, uh, of rent-seeking mechanisms of, in, in the same way than the uh, mafiosi mechanisms of protection uh, demanded uh, payments from the uh, fellows in, in a country, in a village, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we have a combination of this, the access to technology in terms of, of technological dependency that is very, very serious. The access to technology depends upon the payments in terms of rents, not in terms of a, a, a extraordinary profits uh, that could uh, a, a, a incentivize the a, a introduction of new technology, but in terms of uh, exaction, in terms of tributary mechanisms. And that is exactly the same what uh, it happens with the financial innovations. Uh, uh, any new enterprise, any enterprise, both in the North and in the South, require the protection between quotes of the speculative platform in order to have uh, uh, prevention against risks, prevention against uncertainty, uh, 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 patronage in terms of the financial markets, uh, otherwise, it is impossible to prosper. The, 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 the behavior in the North and in the South appear because in the South, the underdevelopment of the financial markets uh, forces uh, these enterprises to go through offshore mechanisms to uh, tax havens in order to connect in a privileged form to these circuits of uh, protection from the North. 
So these archaic forms of exploitation and domination in the context of the structural crisis of overproduction of merchandises and capitals, increasingly related to fictitious capital, uh, and continuous technological and scientific pro uh, progress had transformed also the uh, internal forces, both, both economic and political forces in Latin America. So part of the problem now in Latin America is that the wave, uh, the pink wave of the, um, the beginning of the, of the century has been transformed now in a much weaker coalition in which financial capital has has demanding ransom in, uh, in terms of, uh, of the restriction of the transformative uh, measures that any progressive government could undertake. The uh, very uh, severe crisis in Argentina is a proof of that. And the, the extreme moderation of Lopez Obrador in Mexico show us how important it is to understand these internal forces rather to uh, 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 focus specifically in the surface, in the political surface of the situation. Even the same, the same Lula today with the correlation of forces of today due to the advance of the oligarchical agenda is in a much weaker position than the Lula of 2003. And the same happens with every progressive uh, forces and coalitions in Latin America. This is not to lose uh, hope respect, with respect to the possibilities of, of a transformative horizon, but it is important to have a scientific approach to this situation. If we deal with the uh, neural uh, 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 strategic uh, points of, 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 of of the margin of maneuver uh, of, uh, of the oligarchical agenda uh, that resides in the monetary financial situation, we can transform the conditions. So they, there is now uh, an increasing dissonance between monopolic productive, productive capital, even in the center of the system, plus monopolic financial capital linked to production in the sense of Hilferding, that is mostly the, the scope of, of, of most of uh, Marxist and post Keynesian literature versus this new uh, formation of monopolized speculative capital. This is a neoplasm, a neoplasia. This is an excrescency of uh, financial capitalism that has dominated now the process of accumulation. The self referenced uh, parasitic hypertrophy of speculative capital that perturbs dynamic coherence of productive capital with higher levels of overproduction in the value chain uh, disruptions and challenges to profitability has opened a new possibility of, uh, 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 of alliances, the new possibility of uh, economic policy agenda that could open the doors uh, to new paths of reform a new type of reform that could uh, uh, target the, the strategic points of weakness in the decline of the Anglo-American hegemony, the decline of speculative capital that could uh, create, that could construct policy space and sovereignty in, uh, in the South or specifically in Latin America in order to build up a further process of integration. We, I, I'm going to very, very quickly uh, to present a, a, a very stylized model based upon chaos theory, the post Keynesian and Schumpeterian traditions, and Marx's crucial insights to understand the Greek tragedy like clash of rationalities that de define the limits of the neoliberal agenda. So, we are going to discuss very, very quickly the fictitious capital, rent seeking platform, speculative exaction, and the endogenous uh, turbulence. This uh, chaos theory and the turbulence of the performance of financial assets uh, can be represented with a logistic map to understand the endogenous behavior of uh, financialization. This is not a problem of uh, ideology. Uh, all this discussion uh, among Marxists, among progressive and heterodox economists, uh, uh, if we are in a new phase of financialization, if financialization is parasitic uh, uh, with respect to uh, uh, productive capital, et cetera, et cetera, uh, should be uh, overcome with this type of analysis 
uh, understanding the internal logic of financialization. The growth rates in this, in this model uh, below uh, one uh, are out because uh, it represents that uh, th there is no accumulation, there is no, um, uh, there is no even simple uh, uh, expansion of, of financial capital and fictitious capital. Between in this normalized model, between uh, some levels uh, up to 3.2, promote stable and non explosive financialization increase. And the deregulation is the exogenous uh, uh, trigger to uh, the increase of financialization, the increase of uh, uh, fictitious capital. But stability begets instability. Uh, growth rates above 3.2 in my calculations that started in the second half of the 90s and uh, the effect of this were the Asian, uh, Brazilian and Russian crisis uh, as, as a symptom of a global uh, a crisis of financialization uh, because we have a bifurcation in terms of the attractors, in terms of the results of the same type of uh, dynamics uh, instead of uh, the, 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 the elemental form of, of financial capital of, of, of uh, the extreme form of fetishism, uh, money uh, generating plus money, uh, we have a situation in which uh, under the same fundamentals, in the same conditions, the same type of projects render a negative results. And that uh, the performance of financial assets be, be, be below previous level could include higher than normal bankruptcies and a massive cover up through financial manipulation. Above some level 3.54, uh, uh, bifurcation triggers another bifurcation and another bifurcation at a faster rate. And that is what precisely happened with the implosion of Lehman Brothers in 2007, 2008. Fundamental irreductible uncertainty increases as bankruptcies multiply and the need for financial derivatives and protect, protection in terms of the mafiosi mechanism that we were talking before, uh, booms. The need for financial protection from risk, actuarial uncertainty, efficient uh, market hypothesis cannot, cannot uh, capture the whole fundamental uncertainty of the system. And this uh, endogenized the push for financial growth rates. So uh, up to uh, the end of the previous century, we have basically the increase of financialization based upon uh, political extra economic measures, deregulation, or the uh, transformation of China in a uh, 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 a field of accumulation that could uh, be predated, could be a victim of the predation of, of, uh, of the banking system in the West or the, 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 the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, after the, uh, this endogenous uh, uh, deployment in terms of financialization, we have endogenous forces that feed uh, itself. The mechanism. So the corresponding growth of financial liabilities claims of, of, of future global profits without grounds mm -hmm. uh, creates a huge tension in terms of the structure of property. Ownership structure in terms of stocks enter in a huge contradiction with respect to the flows of financial and speculative capital. So Latin America and the global south we are in the receiving part of these mechanisms that acquires life on its own. So the endogenous growth of financial assets in a context of increasing turbulence and the irreductible uncertainty that prevents productive investment in favor of more speculation begets more speculation and requires more protection between quotes. So the denationalization of the financial systems and the monetary and macroeconomic mechanisms in the South, specifically in Latin America, are a crucial part of the oligarchical agenda in order to uh, funnel out resources to feed the beast. If we cannot stop this uh, uh, hemorrhage, 
if we cannot stop this, those mechanisms of, of extraction of surplus, destruction of metabolism, any effort on behalf of the progressive forces in Latin America and the global South are futile. So what happens after the implosion of Lehman Brothers was a chain reaction of non-performing liabilities. And that requires more liquidity. We are going to go into these details. This is just an illustration. We, ha we, have, we don't have uh, statistics about the global uh, uh, evolution of, of financialization as a percentage of, of the subjacent productive assets. But this can show you how can you can see the most important uh, um, uh, thresholds in terms of the endogenous behavior. In all of this was crucial precisely one of the vectors that the oligarchical agenda is trying to deploy again, the debt crisis, the debt trap. So we have, look at this. This is the uh, US foreign rents uh, or, or in income as percentage of the total income of the uh, American enterprises. And the external debt crisis, not only that trigger this tremendous increase in terms of uh, uh, financialization, not only in the center, but also in the periphery, but also increases the uh, uh, um, exploitation in terms of center periphery relationships. The huge increase of, uh, uh, of transfers from the global south, and this time is not only for the global south, because, because this time uh, under the hysteria of uh, uh, stagflation, they are going to trigger at this time, this type of mechanism, but turbo, but in, because did, it, this time includes the, not only Japan, but uh, uh, West Europe. One of the, mo the most important, the most intimate uh, partners of uh, uh, the Anglo-American empire uh, is now the victim of this vampirism. With this, without this vampirism, the beast cannot survive. So in the red line, you can, this is a very rough uh, approximation of the demands in terms of liquidity that could be uh, uh, corroborate with a, with a huge increase in the money supply, not only from the United States, but also with the Bank of England, the Bank of, the Bank of, of, of Japan, the Swiss National Bank, uh, the European Central Bank, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I have some problems with my computer. Okay, so what happens in Latin America now is that we have to uh, break down, break out of this type of uh, chains, creating our own type of financing. We need not only to delink from the uh, circuit of uh, uh, extraction that comes out of the traditional monetary uh, uh, mechanisms uh, with the the seniorage that the United States obtained by the utilization, the overuse of dollar in the international uh, scenario, but also we need to transform the objectives and the nature of credit in our internal economies. And to create, a, to endogenize prosperity, for example, in the construction of a regional uh, space, uh, within even the, the conditions of capitalism, but under the priorities of the peoples. Productive coherence, poverty reduction, uh, strategic development, uh, conditions for a further integration in terms of production and in terms of, of social processes, uh, infrastructure, and uh, the, the new uh, Silk Road uh, initiatives all around the world can show you how important is this type of uh, initiatives in order to counter up the uh, uh, agenda of speculation and asphyxiation of productive accumulation. The deployment of productive forces uh, cannot be digested 
that by by the oligarchical agenda because we are in the middle of an overproduction crisis overproduction of merchandises overproduction of uh, uh, capitals but this overproduction is a problem of capitalism not a problem of the peoples we need to grow in the Latin American countries, we need to grow. We have very important, significant segments of the population with problems of food. That is why it's so important to fight the possibility of discipline of our populations, the possibility of, 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 of punishing our, uh, our populations with a new food crisis, like uh, the provoked by the speculative capital uh, between 2008 and 2009, with the same mechanisms with the same financial speculative mechanism out of a real uh, supply uh, problem minor supply problem we have it one in the 2007 2008 we have one now a very evident one in with uh, more so with the with the with the ukrainian crisis but not restricted to the ukrainian crisis that comes from uh, several processes before way before the the the, the beginning of, of, of uh, the war in Ukraine, that it was amplified, but by a speculative, the same speculative mechanism in 2009, and now they are trying to profit, to have extra profit out of the pain and the death of the people, uh, precisely to obtain not only immediate uh, profits, immediate resources, but also to obtain a new correlation of forces that could uh, 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 accelerate the uh, indebtedness of the, the whole world, the whole world, specifically the global south, but the whole world. That is why it's so important to connect both uh, issues and to put this in the agenda of the Latin American progressive forces, but also in the agenda of the global forces. I don't know, uh, my, my, my presentation, has stopped to, to move. Well, the second part, uh, very quickly, the second part is to understand the uh, transformations of this financialization process uh, upon the productive sector of, uh, of our economies. In the center of the system, we have a translation of the main uh, priorities, the main objectives of the enterprise. I'm talking about mega corporations, not only the the, the the majority of, of capital, but also the mega corporations. During the Fordist Keynesian uh, uh, accumulation regime, the uh, long term, uh, long term uh, expectations, the long term strategy, uh, uh, privileged uh, the uh, the growth of the enterprise in terms of uh, uh, research and development, in, in terms of uh, um, expansion of infrastructure, in terms of uh, uh, coping uh, new markets, uh, with the uh, this uh, increasing uncertainty uh, uh, in terms of the fixed capital that cannot be amortized, cannot be uh, totally totally uh, discounted. Uh, because of this moral, this accelerated moral obsolescency, you have a, a, a predominance of the uh, 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 capital markets. The short-termism in the capital markets uh, has co-opted the logic, the internal logic of the productive enterprises, and the, that has that has uh, transformed also the logic of the mega corporations instead of the uh, productive expansion uh, uh, prior prioritization during the Fordis Keynesian uh, regime of accumulation, we have a, a new priority that is cash. First, up to this last times uh, is the maximization of revenue uh, that implies a reduction in terms of the productive investment and the transformation of product of productive investment uh, or, or the, 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 the compensation of uh, productive investment in terms of uh, speculative investment in order to uh, increase uh, uh, the, the global profit rate that has transformed, for example, uh, the icons of the productive era, for example, General Motors of, or General Electric or Ford or Chrysler, 
from uh, uh, productive uh, uh, mega corporations into, um, into uh, hedge funds. General Electric now is GE Capital, it's a hedge fund. Uh, so what we have now, this, this situation has been furthered by the, the uh, decomposition of the, uh, the very early uh, decomposition of the financialized mode of production, the financialized uh, uh, regime of accumulation into a new type of priority that uh, uh, privileged cash flows. So instead of the uh, kind of middle term uh, 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 maximization of revenue, we have now a maximization of the more liquid assets of the enterprise and the minimization of the more immediate liabilities. This increase in the, uh, or the this, this, this uh, emphasize of uh, the strategy of the firm around the cash flow uh, is feeding in a very explosive way the uh, capital markets, the most liquid capital markets, especially the stock markets. And that has created a very uh, a strict situation with respect to uh, the connections that those uh, chain values have in the, in the South, in the global South. Uh, and that has accelerated also the uh, rhythm and also the magnitude, the, the, this, this is an intensification of the plus value, uh, surplus value uh, transfer, but also the uh, transfer of metabolism. It's not only uh, um, uh, uh, an attack against, uh, against uh, the, um, oh, that's good. Um, sorry, um, Petro, uh, you have another uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. That's that's great. I, I I'm going to, to 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 close this time, but my my presentation is frozen. I don't know what happens. Okay. So what the point that I'm trying to say is that this is not a, a fact. This is not a phenomenon, a process a process uh, uh, restricted to the monetary financial sphere. But this is uh, basically um, a, a symptom uh, that affects not only the external connection of the financialization in the North with the subordinated financialization in the South, but it's also a transformation in terms of our role in the uh, global uh, value chains. The, the logic of functioning of the enterprises and the, the enclaves and the, uh, the, uh, the partners in the South now are, um, have to uh, comply, have to enforce this uh, thirst, this, this desperate need of liquidity that uh, the enterprises, even the productive enterprises in the North, the matrices of the transnationals in the North are forced upon because of this uh, decomposition of the um, um, the decomposition of the uh, a, a speculative endogenous forces. The problem is that uh, as we advance in terms of this graph, we advance uh, in with higher and higher rates of growth of financialization, the turbulence, the irreductible uncertainty in the markets require more and more protection, more and more dependency on the uh, derivatives and the offshores and the tax havens and the uh, accounting manipulation. So you can, if all the, all the uh, uh, chain reaction that uh, comes from the lack of payments, the lack of liquidity that you are uh, a passive victim because you, you were not paid, you transfer to another, uh, another agents in a network of effects uh, that cannot receive uh, uh, payments. Uh, you can uh, uh, artificially suppress that situation in terms of accounting mechanisms, in terms of more derivatives, in terms of shadow banking, in terms of uh, uh, tax evasion, 
in terms of capital flights, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Shell companies and all the Pandora, Panama, uh, Paradise Papers had uh, shown a very limited situation of a, lim a very limited revelation of what is going on. But the problem is that you cannot solve the problem of liquidity. You can, you can make up an apparent uh, artificial uh, 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 balance in terms of, sol uh, of solvency, but not in terms of liquidity. So that is why is they cannot stop injecting more and more uh, 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 quantitative easing mechanisms. It doesn't matter which is the name that they are, they are pulling on. Um, COVID was a kind of uh, curtain because at uh, the end of 2019, a new, a new crisis come with the repo mechanisms. This is the most liquid uh, type of markets in the world. This is the more, the more secure uh, interbank uh, uh, money market. And even that, due to the lack of confidence or more so the certainty among bankers that the other bankers were bankrupt totally bankrupt, and that was omnipresent, that uh, uh, the most uh, the kind of the, 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 the citadel of, of liquidity was, uh, has to be bailed out by the central banks of the world. That, is, that, come, that went from September 2019 up to uh, the beginning of, of the coronavirus crisis. And the coronavirus crisis was the cover-up, that was the, the alibi to to inject a, a humongous uh, mass of liquidity through different mechanisms that um, prevented a new, a, new, a new implosion like the Lehman Brothers episode. The problem now is that in the, in the oligarchical agenda is, in, is inexorable, the great reset. We have Stock and flows, this uh, 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 an increasing contradiction between the stock and flows uh, in terms of power, not only in financial and productive uh, uh, conditions, but also in terms of uh, ownership, ownership structure. So they had, they had deployed an economic policy that had been very successful despite all the the, the atrivas of, of the heterodox economist, uh, the economic policy has been very successful from the point of view of the oligarchy. They have transformed a weakness in a, a, in a, in a strength. They had transformed a situation of, 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 of a total destruction and the verge of, of, of obliteration in, into a, a, a situation in which they, they can uh, have the whole world as a hostage, especially the most, the most vulnerable segments of the, of the, of the situation. That, that is, depends, that is nothing inexorable. That, is, that depends on the, the conditions, the correlation of forces during a, a period, even with the most moderate expressions of the pink wave in Latin America, we show that it was possible to stop them with the audit of the debt, with the reduction of the debt, with the new financial architecture. And they, they trembled about this. They, were, they had a lot of fear about this. Now they are with a, a, a panic attack with the possibilities of a new financial architecture, with the possibilities, for example, of the, of the digital yuan with the possibilities of uh, uh, exchange mechanisms, uh, uh, local currencies, local and regional currencies, local systems of, of uh, financing, uh, because that is at the core of the power deployment, the sphere, the monetary and financial sphere of the speculative uh, uh, oligarchy is the citadel is the headquarters of the, the power as it is. So Latin America showed with a lot of limitations, without a, a very clear and scientific assessment of the problem, assessment of the situation, assessment of the forces 
and weakness of the enemy, we were able to show very punctually which are the strategic possibilities of a qualitative jump in terms of the correlation of forces. The setback has been deleterious because without a clear understanding of what is going on, we are going to repeat, even with the same, the same uh, comrades, with the same personalities involved, we are going to repeat this, but as, as a farce, because we don't have the instruments, we don't have the tools to understand with which is the challenge that we have to face. To understand these internal forces of capitalism is to understand which is the place of Latin American in history. Without these theoretical instruments, we are blind. We are prior, our priorities are totally, totally uh, confused. Even if the immediate conjunctural correlation of forces construction demand us to have uh, some types of agenda, electoral and uh, governmental agenda, we need to face which are the red lines over our strategic construction. Sovereign construction, sovereign construction uh, uh, requires to, the understanding of this long process of transition of capitalism. The senile mode of production is producing itself, is, 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 is a dialectic negation of the uh, capitalist mode of production in its demise is the transformation in a techno-feudalist system is a rent-seeking mechanism that opened the doors for a new correlation of forces, for a potential, a potential uh, 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 ocean of alliances. Because a lot of forces within the uh, historical block of power, not only from the four Keynesian regime of accumulation, but also from the uh, financialized, globalized uh, regime of accumulation has been let out, left out of the new agenda. The Great Reset includes a lot of very uh, 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 incredible, incredible uh, targets in terms of population reduction, in terms of uh, submission of the population that betrays the, the, the whole promise of, of, of the capitalist modernity. We need to uh, 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 embrace all these principles, all these universal values that uh, were not finished, that were not uh, 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 achieved by, by the promise of capitalism redemption against their ancient regime. And we need to transform this in a new horizon, a new horizon of conviviality, a new mode of life, uh, much more humane, much fair, much uh, ecological, and uh, uh, based upon the uh, democratization of the uh, technological process. Uh, the technological revolution now, uh, of course, has been uh, 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 tamed by the emphasis and the priorities of uh, monopolic capitalism. More so, that has been, that has been deformed by the uh, priorities and the uh, limitations of the preservation of Anglo-American hegemony. But we need now to transform this in a new type of, of, of uh, uh, construction horizon in terms of the needs of the people. It doesn't matter if this is part of, of the uh, capitalist mode of production, if, if money, uh, a lot of friends from, from the progressive uh, uh, camp used to say, oh, but you are talking about money and money is capitalism. You are talking about a bank and bank is capitalism. Yeah, but we need in the same way that, uh, for example, in, in West Europe, uh, uh, the emergent forces of, of uh, the bourgeoisie uh, fight feudalism as another feudal power, for example, from the cities, 
In the same way, the transition to a superior mode of life requires the transformation of the world as it is. The linking in the spirit of Samir Amin requires now a scientific determination of which are the red lines in the power of the speculative oligarchy, but also the red lines in the agenda of our peoples. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, your excellent presentation. And um, uh, I would like to ask uh, Tong Yi to uh, moderate these uh, sections. Yeah, please, Tong Yi. Yes, well, I, I guess it's time now for me to uh, introduce our discussions before they begin the intervention. Um, so uh, le let me first introduce uh, Dr. Mauricio de Souza Sabadini, uh, our, our first discussant. Uh, Mauricio has a doctorate in economics from Paris Bonn University, Pantheon Sorbonne. He teaches at the Department of Economics and the Postgraduate Program in Social Policy at the Federal University of Espirito Santo, Brazil. He was director of the Brazilian Society of Political Economy from 2016 to 18, and the president of the Brazilian Society um, of Political Economy um, from 2018 to 2020. His research area includes political economy with an emphasis on contemporary capitalism and financialization. Uh, our other discussion is uh, Dr. Arindam Banerjee, who is currently an associate professor in economics at the School of Liberal Studies, um, Ambedkar University in New Delhi. He teaches and researches in the area of agrarian development, colonialism, political economy, food security and poverty, and biofuels. He has published on issues like the agrarian crisis in India, colonialism, global food crisis, corn ethanol and food feed fuel competition and food policy in India in journals like Development and Change and Economic and Political Weekly. He has also co-edited the book Dispossession, Deprivation and Development, Essays for Utsa Patnik. His recent publication is titled Locating Agrarian Labor Within the Contours of Imperialism, A Historical Review in the Oxford Handbook of Economic Imperialism, which is edited by Zach Cope and Emmanuel Ness. Um, with, without further ado, I'd invite um, either Mauricio or Arundam. I mean, you decide between the both of you uh, who would like to go first. Thank you. So allow me to start. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Greetings from uh, the Brazilian brothers and sisters from the Federal University of Espírito Santo. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much, Professor Jaji. And also like to congratulate the organizers of the event. We know it is not easy to organize such an event and a long event, which is the case today. Also, I would like to congratulate my colleagues Professor Pérez, the discussants, the interpreters, who are working very hard today. And I apologize because I don't speak Spanish, English, and Chinese fluently. So, because I do not uh, speak Spanish and English in a proficient manner. I decided to speak Portuguese. I could speak French, but uh, anyway, I thank you very much indeed for having interpreters in this meeting. So I'll talk slowly and I'll make a few comments and I am aware that I have 50 minutes and I will respect my time. So I will start with some structural uh, uh, comments based on what Professor Pedro mentioned, but I will also 
add and bring some specificities in relation uh, to Brazil and in relation to the historical discussion on the single currency. Of course, I'm just going to mention a few ideas because uh, in view of the lack of time, I cannot go into details. But first of all, I would like to say that at the Federal University of the State of Espírito Santo, together with uh, Professor Paula Capitani, who also attended the event, and a few years ago, Professor Rinaldo Cacagnolo, we all took part in a discussion together with the Brazilian Society of Political Economy to try and discuss the dynamics of uh, accumulation in contemporary capitalism. And we've been able to identify some uh, factors such as Professor Pérez mentioned, namely whether we are in a new phase of contemporary capitalism. And we believe there are two factors that actually influence other countries in different manners. One of them is the uh, production and the, the, the rent seeking through all the means of accumulation and uh, through different types of flexibilization, both uh, commercially in terms of labor with several labor reforms that uh, have been passed worldwide and also the financial flexibilization. And that's my point. That is the second particularity of um, capitalism. And I believe Professor Pedro Perez has already shown us, uh, shown us very clearly, which is the dimension of the financialization or the financial globalization. And um, also in France, they would call it the mondialization, uh, financial mondialization. And other, there are conceptual differences between those uh, names or categories. But here, um, in this debate, we have been focused uh, very strongly uh, on the, um, the concept of fictitious capital. And we have been focused um, in reading uh, Marx's work on book three, especially based on book one, on the theory of value. But we are trying to understand the functional uh, manners in which capitalism transforms itself. And this fictitious capital has a very specific characteristic. This uh, we are used to call as financial capital. This is a term by Rudolf Hildes. Professor Petro has already uh, pointed out. This is not only a conceptual difference, because in terms of uh, capitalism, you have a very direct uh, relation between uh, the, the bank capital and the productive capital, which financed a, a very good part of what uh, was the development in both Brazil and Latin America. It has a relation, it is related to uh, productive uh, capitalism, and the banks had a very important role in the process of the industrialization of uh, uh, our country. And the concept of financial capital, which has been many times mistranslated, comes from Hilfred, and uh, it is associated to the productive dynamics. Why do we think that financial capital is has a merely speculative um, basis. And when we we are talking about a financial crisis, we are talking about capitalist crisis. Of course, the dynamics in the, in the financial realm has a more uh, visible um, uh, expression. But the main uh, goal of everything is, of course, generating surplus under all its forms, absolute or relative uh, surplus, extra um, surplus in the market too. And financial, uh, sorry, fictitious capital is important for us to understand 
on the ground. How is this uh, dynamics impacting the economic policies that are being generated and in the economic aspect, how does that interfere, interfere with the life of um, the corporations that are represented in the financial market? And there are some, um, some aspects of the fictitious capital. It is purely speculative without trying to value itself without the mediation of labor. And that is completely um, a complete contradiction because as we understand that the all wealth uh, comes from, from labor. Although having a, a speculative basis and not a, a concrete real one and not producing a surplus, it will demand um, rent through through interest, and that is uh, having a, a great impact in um, in Latin America in terms of the payments of a public debt, and in Brazil that is very uh, important. We have one of on the on one of the highest uh, uh, interest rates in, in the world, and also what we call um, fictitious rent that we have that's the concept we have been discussing here the logics of capital by appropriating the wealth that is generated by by labor if now we are talking about uh, this financial profit it's going to be paid by workers in brazil we can discuss that but it is about 30 or 40 percent of um, what the, what the state generates is already um, going to be used for paying debt. So that already um, generates a problem for the budgets for education, healthcare, etc. So this is the, the rent of the state that is being transferred through the speculative nature of the financial capital that highlights what Marx uh, said on the tree. So today, the dynamics of capitalism, if we understand that fictitious capital is very important for us to understand what is um, contemporary capitalism, the fetish of this logic seems to be much more developed or mystified. He talks about the, the fetish of uh, commodities and then the fetish of money. And then we are talking now about a very sophisticated form of um, fetish that is very difficult to um, to treat, to, to understand. I'm using my time here for to, to call your attention. And I don't have answers uh, for, that, for those questions. But uh, we have to understand what would be examples of uh, policies such as the creation of a single currency, autonomous policies. I don't want to give an answer to that, but in the, I, I'm thinking in the sense of, uh, if we observe the reality of Latin America, and we are observing processes of uh, particular uh, economic formations, since the 16th century to the 21st century, all of those processes have uh, particular um, characteristics. Here in Brazil, very recently, uh, slavery was uh, abolished. So the industrialization of Brazil happens in the 20th century. I mean, the 1950s, uh, talking about heavy industries. And it has been uh, completely dismantled by the advancement of the neoliberal agenda. But in the 20, it's only in the 20th century in, uh, that we see capitalism really developing in Brazil. And in the end of the 20th century will come the neoliberal agenda and it will change completely uh, this, this uh, structure. And that said, and I think I have uh, five minutes left, 
what are the limits and the possibilities of creating, for example, a single currency? If we face the inequalities and the differences between the different processes of um, the creation, the development of uh, capitalist economies in the region, this idea has been um, regaining space uh, when some some people uh, will defend it and, and make proposals or statements in the media. The current government itself has stated such a possibility. And how do we understand this as a step towards um, uh, a common uh, ground for building unity in the region? But understanding that there are very important differences, what are the limits and possibilities of this kind of polity looking towards um, economic integration? If we consider all that has been destructed. So these proposals that are being seen, uh, although they are not structured and published in terms of a, a concrete uh, program, political program. This is more about what's coming out in the media. But some, some tell um, that it should be different from uh, the process of the euro, but mostly focused on regaining space uh, from the dominance of uh, the dollar. So, uh, in a, a recent paper by Professor Fernando Haddad, has addressed the possibility of doing this without uh, necessarily a compulsory um, having the same currency in each country. But in the context of the capitalist dynamics, which is dominant, in, in which there is a dominance of a speculative capital in the context of underdeveloped countries with a great degree of dependency historically from its formation in our colonial past. Our colonial past is not a past. We are talking about um, a current present of colonialism, and we hope that will be, uh, uh, that can be overcome. And the process of a, a, a unified um, economic process is something we hope for. I've just shown you some uh, points. I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I think we should put that into the context of how does the region and the country um, both having uh, an economy that was first based in, on slavery, so this is very recently historically, but all forms of a dynamic integration of the peoples and the possibility of an autonomy, although relative, uh, would be absolutely um, welcome. The question I put are the structural limitations for that to happen in the context of a system having money in its um, multiple functions in a, a very specific uh, way. Consider the, the specific cities of uh, the local and regional economies. Thank you for my time. Please, uh, Arinda. Yeah, please. Thanks to the organizers and, and my colleagues uh, uh, for, for kind of participating in this uh, uh, very important discussions. Uh, thanks to Professor Pedro for uh, presenting a, a rich, uh, vast, and uh, insightful uh, kind of um, uh, discourse, narrative on where we stand today uh, with regard to the history of capitalism, the whole process of financialization. And it is without doubt uh, that, uh, I mean, over the last uh, few decades, uh, we have seen that the pace of financialization has increased uh, many fold. And uh, with the digital revolution, I think it is now exercising uh, an unprecedented control over, over labor, 
uh, over resources and over markets, uh, and of course, over uh, I mean the corresponding human entities uh, and the natural entities of the, of that the producers, the consumers, uh, and of course, a large part of nature. Uh, with uh, I think big data and digital surveillance, uh, capital is trying to uh, take uh, or produce. Uh, uh, or appropriate uh, more and more of super profits. But I think as uh, right by uh, Professor Petro uh, passed that uh, the more important contradiction that uh, capitalism is facing today uh, is the supranational character that uh, finance capital has acquired. And it is now in a position uh, to extract rent uh, correctly uh, noted uh, uh, as, as some similar to the activities of, uh, of the mafias uh, by manipulating regulations within the nations, particularly the south, but not restricted to the south, maybe even in the north, northern countries. And uh, from there to controlling different kinds of property, uh, physical property to digital property. Uh, now, where I want to kind of uh, bring in some thoughts, uh, which, which might uh, kind of help us in uh, understanding uh, or, or, or kind of engaging with this uh, situation a little better is, uh, you know, I mean, this whole contradiction between uh, the productive uh, calls of capital, the productive nature of capital and, and the speculative nature of capital is clearly the, uh, is clearly one of the major contradictions. Uh, and having said that, however, uh, we need to think a little bit about uh, uh, the whole concept of productivity, as we have uh, witnessed it, uh, witnessed in, in our narratives, uh, particularly the narratives that are forwarded by, that are promoted, propagated uh, uh, by the interests of capital, by by, uh, by the big capitalist interests. Uh, if you look at uh, the the history of capitalism, again, in, in a, if, if we go go into a slightly longer history, uh, it is the uh, we we find the first thing to note is that. The question of productivity has always uh, been linked or driven by the interests of appropriating surplus, uh, producing profits, but not always profits, uh, well, largely appropriating surplus. And uh, it is not so much; it has rather not been linked with the uh, with with the uh, needs of of, of the uh, human welfare, uh, with the questions of reproduction of life. Uh, and and that I think is uh, is is a continuity that exists as we have transitioned from the old uh, 40s Keynesianist uh, uh, capitalism to this new model of uh, you know financial uh, financial capitalism. But increasingly, more and more of our real economies are controlled by by finance finance capital. If we look at uh, I mean a slightly longer history of capitalism, very briefly. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, the whole uh, disciplining of the wage working class, uh, the whole emergence of what we call as the uh, as as the working class, the industrial working class, is something that uh, happened through a social cultural transition, where productivity uh, or being productive, quote unquote, is something that was put at the center of the of the larger social cultural discourse. And uh, you know, again, if we if we go right back to the English capitalism, the early days of English capitalism, we find that the the thrust there is the lengthening of the working day. That people have to work from not for six hours uh, in a day uh, as as they used to do as petty producers, as people dependent on uh, land and other kind of uh, non-capitalist forms of production. But they have to work for fourteen hours. They have to work for sixteen hours in some in industry. That of course, with the emergence of the working class, we know that uh, with the with unionization, with the, with the organization of the working class, it was not sustainable. And uh, thereafter, in the in in, in the uh, let's say the post-industrial or the industrial part of uh, capitalism, particularly let's say from uh, the second half of the 19th century, we see that there's a distinct shortening of the working day. But even there, capitalism actually ensures that surplus is not lost out again by emphasizing on the productivity of capital and and there the question is okay labor of course will be productive but we need to uh, kind of increase our innovations uh, we need to renew technology at a faster and faster rate and we need to produce that relative surplus value so that uh, even with the shortening of the working day uh, we remain productive 
somewhere i mean when i when i think about that history of capitalism you find that where we stand today with the digital revolution and with with finance having acquired much greater pace of movement across the world uh, again we find that the productivity that that linkage between productivity being productive and you know the appropriation of surplus is is still in a, is still continuing in in some way and there is while we do have certain contradictions between the between what existed as part of the keynesian uh, codis model and what we now have as the financial model there is also that continuity that exists and that is something that uh, i think we need to also engage with in order particularly when we try to search or and, uh, and and where i'm going is actually to uh, reopen our box of concepts uh, to kind of uh, uh, not discard productivity but link productivity uh, not to the question of generating or generation or appropriation of surplus but link productivity with the question of reproduction of life with the question of sustainability with the question of ecological ecological preservation and in this uh, respect i just want to kind of highlight uh, one particular uh, phenomenon uh, which uh, is something that uh, again uh, which falls more within my Uh, domain of exp expertise, uh, which is to look at this question of food crisis, and of course we know that uh, you know the new century, the 21st century, has been a a, a more uh, you know a volatile situation as far as the food markets are concerned. We have had the global food crisis from around the around 2005 to 2012. Then we have had a lull, but we are now again uh, we are we are we are not really in a very stable situation. But we were at a in a stable situation. Uh, or what has been identified as a stable situation of food prices or food markets uh, from between in a in a 30 year period between the 1970s uh, oil price shock 1973 and the decade of the 70s and the global food crisis that we have had so that decade of the 1980s and 1990s is something where uh, you know there was a uh, there was a uh, significantly high confidence on food markets the whole context within which the uruguay round of negotiations the wto gat uh, agreements were reached reached where a large number of countries kind of put their faith on the food markets and adopted the global food markets and adopted uh, different kinds of pursue tried to pursue different kinds of uh, export oriented policies uh, it was uh, it was also something that uh, kind of attributed to the success of the global uh, corporate food uh, uh, food empires uh, the corporate food regime as uh, you know the the food regime analysts have told us where uh, it it was it was kind of claimed not by all but by some that the global corporations particularly agricultural corporations agri business have actually transformed agriculture in a decisive manner that it has solved the food question once and for and which is the reason why food prices are so stable and we have that you know we can we can actually have confidence over the global food market of course we know that with the global food prices with the ethanol production uh, with the linkage of food prices with oil with speculative finance moving into commodity futures all of those uh, that that confidence burst but what i want to say is that even the earlier Uh, so called stable period was not really a uh, situation where things were uh, really looking good if we look at the data very carefully we find that globally the per capita food production actually had started declining from somewhere from the early 90s and that is something that happened up to uh, well up to uh, say 2002 2003 however that was a period even when per capita food production or grain production was declining food grain prices were stable and they were stable because the per capita food consumption was also constant and when you disaggregate and look at the picture you find that it's the 1980s the whole process starts with uh, the latin american country continent the caribbean region uh, parts of west asia actually finds seeing a significant contraction in the consumption of food grains uh, indicating some kind of a, a crisis within the larger sections of the population uh some uh, and and you find that it corresponds with the with the neoliberal turn of policy which started 
earlier in the case of the Latin American continent, uh, countries, and then it kind of comes into uh, say Asia at a much later period. And in the 1990s, you find that South Asia, kind of particularly India, kind of is, is witnessing the same similar kinds of uh, decline in food drain, uh, consumption. However, uh, the major event and which is, is something that uh, is not so much recognized when we celebrate the success of the global corporations is the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, in, in, the uh, in the late 1990s, in 1989-91. When you look at the data for the former CIS countries uh, over the decade 1991 to 99, that roughly that 9-10 years, you find there's a massive collapse in terms of the uh, of the consumption. Just to put it into perspective, uh, you know, over that 90s decade, when food prices were very stable, Soviet Union, which is transforming its old socialist system, trying to adjust into a new or emerge into a new market-driven system, dismantling its, uh, you know, food subsidies, and there were massive food subsidies in the Soviet Union. Witnessed the ex, I mean, the ex-Soviet countries witnessed a total decline of 112 million tons of food grain consumption over that one single decade. And to put it, put that into perspective, it accounted for 76% of the increase of food consumption in the world. So had the Soviet collapse not happened, definitely the food markets would have much, been much more tighter. You know, there wouldn't have been so much confidence on food grain prices being stable. Uh, you know, cheap food imports can uh, solve our food security and hunger problems. The Soviet Union also completely withdrew from the global trade and it constituted around 16 to 17 percent of the world food imports. So, so that also eased the market. And these ex-Soviet Union countries also witnessed a decline of population by around 10 million people. Or in other words, you know, this march of the global corporate food regime, the so-called successes of, you know, stabilizing markets was really on some kind of a uh, slow or rapid genocide. Uh, depending on which country you are in, the as well as depending on the mass income deflations that were being regenerated or mass income deflations that were being generated by the neoliberal policies in much of the southern uh, uh, parts of the world, you know, much of the south. So my point is come back to the point where I started off is that why. While there is a while there is a need for opening the conceptual box, there is also a need for also reevaluating whether global capital or you know big capital, corporate capital has even lived up to the promises that it had, to the claims that it had, and there we clearly see at least with as far as agriculture or uh, the the agrarian sphere is concerned, the the, the question of food is uh, concerned, the global corporates are not really kind of. Unequivocally, uh, uh, unequivocally or unambiguously lived up to the claims that has been made as far as the questions of productivity and uh, you know uh, technological innovation, technological advancement is concerned. So I think we need to question uh, 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 capital uh, on, 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 on that ground and look for non-capitalist modes of production also, which takes better uh, uh, better uh, care of the ecological questions. It it kind of focuses on human welfare and what I would like to kind of end this. It focuses on uh, the question of reproduction of life. I think that is the sphere where we can then build alternatives uh, again through international global solidarity with uh, with people from across the country. Coming. I think I'll just stop there and if there are some clarifications. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Arun. Uh, now I'll ask Doctor. Uh, Pedro, Baez, if you'd like to respond to the discussions, if thank so, please. Thank you very please. much. Um, uh, thanks for the for the very multifaceted and rich uh, discussion of my partners. Um, uh, I agree with uh, uh, a lot of what they said, but uh, just for the for the uh, impulse of of the debate, I'll uh, I'll try to uh, uh, clarify some items, um, very few of them, in a very telegraphic way. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, fictitious capital. Um, I think we, we need to study a, li a little bit more with much more, in a much more careful way, the statistics uh, in order to compare what uh, uh, Marx wrote uh, one and a half century ago and what is going on now. 
Um, to talk, let, let apart uh, China and the initiatives like the New Silk Road, uh, and let's concentrate in the OECD countries, the privileged terrain of, of the Anglo-American hegemony. Um, you have, uh, in terms of um, a gross formation of brute capital, uh, that means uh, the increase of, of, of productive capital in the year, uh, is something around uh, three trillions. It's less than three trillion dollars. Three trillion dollars. Out of them, the productive credit from the banks is not, not even the 10%. And among the initial public offerings, that means the uh, stock market operations related to fresh capital to production, we are not uh, summing up these two, we are not uh, reaching half of a, 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 a billion, half, half of a trillion, that means 500 billion. Uh, compare this with the uh, derivatives. It's a very narrow and partial measure of fictitious capital. We are talking of 4.7 quadrillion dollars. In order of magnitudes, please, the overwhelming weight of fictitious capital have subsumed the logic of financial capital, the logic of the circulation, the, the capital in the circulation in terms of M dash M prime in Marx Capital, volume one, volume two, volume three, especially the section five. So we need to understand not only in quantitative terms, but also in qualitative terms, the subsumption of the logic, not only of financial capital to the logic uh, of fictitious capital, but also the logic of productive capital, not only to the logic of fictitious of financial capital that was addressed by, by Hilferd in Lenin and other theoreticians uh, one century ago, but now to the logic of fictitious capital and the endogenous forces of fictitious capital, the outgrowing, the internal outgrowing of fictitious capital that demand compulsory, compulsory demand liquidity. So you are transforming all the value chains, not only, not only in the sphere of monetary and financial dynamics, but also in terms of the internal logic of the, between quotes, productive enterprises. We, we have uh, listened about the transformation from that logic of uh, 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 food production at the global level. And that has not only in, uh, in impregnated the, 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 the monetary logic of, of and the, 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 the managing logic of, of, of uh, the administration of, of the enterprise, but also the technology and the development of technology. One a huge example in that terms is precisely the uh, genetically modified organisms. Those are not made, they, those are not planned, those are not uh, uh, from the inception that are not designed to solve the problems of life, of humanity. Those are, have been uh, uh, designed from the beginning to solve the problems, not only of, of, of productive profits, but also the problem of fictitious capital reproduction. In terms of global holdings, in terms of the short-termism in the stock markets in terms of derivatives. And the same happened with the vaccines. It's very clear. Look, we have also uh, financial capital in the Hilferding sense. We have monopolic capital, uh, 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 monopolic productive capital. We have uh, states, uh, empires under the, the domination of productive monopolic capital. Uh, when the uh, viruela and the poliomyelitis and the uh, 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 other type of the, the first wave of vaccines. And the development and the history of those type of vaccines has nothing to do with what, what happened 
during the coronavirus situation. So it's a very, very stressed situation in terms of the contradiction between the logic of capital, mostly fictitious capital, the inner logic is not in the sphere of circulation. That, that, that happened in, 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 in 150 years ago. Now is an endogenous situation. And what we need to know is uh, uh, against this overwhelming uh, power that has been introjected in, into our lives, even, even in, in our most intimate uh, uh, sphere of, 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 of life, how can we do? What can we do? How can we uh, uh, effectively counter, counter uh, 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 this type of, of agendas? To, uh, the second point is uh, we have to be very careful. Uh, I remember uh, our friend uh, Pablo Nakatani, I uh, clarified time and again, not only in our encounter there in, uh, in, uh, under the auspicious of the Global University for Sustainability, but also in Brazil, that this is nothing to do with a unique currency. Not in the official documents signed by the president, nor in the, the theoretical discussion that we tried to, to raise during those years. Nobody were talking about a unique currency. This is a colonial mentality that some friends in, in Brazil, in Argentina, even in the left, has been captured, the imagination has been captured by Europe. Nobody has been talking about the Euro in Latin America. That is a colonial mentality. This is an abomination. We are talking about the construction of a new layer of sovereignty, a supranational sovereignty over the strengthening of the monetary sovereignty within each country. Built up from within the uh, 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 expansion and the intensification of the policy space within each one of our countries, we are pro proposing the construction of a new space of decision, of collective decision, of sovereignty construction, of defense, of the linking against the logic of the speculative agenda. So we have, for example, Right now, the, 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 the macroeconomic problems that uh, uh, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico even faces, face, are, are facing now. So we, we have this uh, 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 trade-off between the uh, local stability in terms of prices and interest rates and the exchange rate, uh, uh, exchange rate uh, stability. Everything is connected because both of them are related to the carry trade mechanisms. That is one of the branches of fictitious capital, a global fictitious capital reproduction. Right now, in order to have an export from Argentina to Brazil, you need for the Brazilian guy to buy dollars in the local market of dollars, of devices. That uh, 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 generates pressure on the local uh, 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 chain rate market and the demands a response in monetary terms, for example, some pressure over the interest, the domestic interest rate. So the, the, and of course, this has some consequences in terms of the payment of the public debt. So you have a, a trigger from one uh, microeconomic uh, need in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, international trade between a border trade among, among neighbors you have a, 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 a chain reaction on exchange rate policy, commercial policy, a, a monetary policy, financial policy, and fiscal policy. With all the uh, restrictions and trade-offs that ended up uh, 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 strengthening the news of uh, austerity policies. What we are talking is instead of using a, a dollar, because you don't need you don't need a dollar to buy something from Brazil to Argentina or from Brazil to Ecuador or from Brazil to from Ecuador, even if Ecuador is dollarized. You don't need a dollar in order to make these type of transactions. 
as the Russian crisis had shown us very clearly, very clearly. But unfortunately, our friends, even in the heterodox camp in economics and among the academia, are still thinking in European terms. So what we are talking about is the construction of a new type of payment system that do not require not only the use of uh, dollars, we need, to, we need to go through the SWIFT mechanism. We need to use correspondent banks in uh, our countries with a correspondent uh, relationship with a bank in the United States that goes through the federal uh, wire, through the SWIFT mechanism in order to have the correspondent bank in the United States that have a correspondent bank in Brazil. In order to make, a mechan in order to make one transaction, we can have this. As, as, as the digital yuan has showed us now, we had this mechanism since 2010 with the Sucre, a direct relationship between the buyer and the seller with the correspondent central banks, and that's it. And the SWIFT, when, when we talk about this 15 years ago, they, they talk about conspiracy theory. Our friends in Brazil, our Marxist friends in Brazil were talking about conspiracy theory. And now it's very clear that they have been using the SWIFT mechanism, supposedly at, at private enterprises, as a warfare mechanism. They use this against, against Panama when the invasion in 1989, they used this against Cuba in the blocking of Cuba during the last six decades. They have used this against Nicaragua. They have used this against Venezuela. They have used this against Chile of agenda. They have used this against Iran. They have used this against Afghanistan. They have used this against, and now it's very clear, it's all very open. They have used this in the sanctions against, against Russia. So we need to delink about out of this type of situations. It's as simple as, as, as this. And as it happens during the, 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 the 30, the, the, the crisis, the previous structural crisis of our production of the 30s, we have to improvise. Even the right wing, even, even the, uh, 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 the bourgeois forces in our countries, because this is a matter of survival they need to, to uh, look for new paths in order to survive. Otherwise, Latin America and the rest of the world, included Western Europe, are going to repeat the same tragedy of the external debt trap that is going to strengthen the declining, the decrepitude of the oligarchical agenda in order to uh, uh, lead us as a whole world to a, a scenario of war, conflict, and famine and degradation. So we need to understand scientifically which are the real conditions of the functioning of capital today, not the formal categories of the books. We need to understand the real internal nexus, the real internal relationships and the dynamics that those had began. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have uh, collected some questions from a uh, Chinese audience and I will uh, read it uh, one by one in Chinese and uh, please choose um, English, Spanish and Portuguese uh, interpretation. Um, the first question, Lula proposed to promote a single currency for Latin America. So how would it work at best and what could be the effects? And also what is the worst scenario? Number two, Dr. Pedro, you were involved in the design of the Latin American single currency and the Bank of the South. What did you hope to achieve? How did it work? What were the final setbacks? And what were the reasons for the failure? Number three. 
the experience of the euro what is the effect and what is the constraints and what reference it can give to the uh, to the for the latin america single currency question number four is to mauricio if lula is elected what which policies will restore the better policies of the previous labor party which are the new policies that is in the campaign now question number five is for pedro so how do you how how can latin america de-dollarize and what exactly do we refer by real economy how does civil society can respond to the problems of uh, finalization and the looting of the resources number six which countries in latin america are experiencing food crisis and do you think is this related to the failure of the unfinished land reform number seven Can you please describe the basis on which Lula proposes to create a unified Latin American currency and what is the reaction of the various circles? Number eight, Michael Hassan advocates the elimination of foreign debts. What does all the speakers think about this? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Victor, you have questions and comments okay okay please Victor. Sí. Bueno, en lugar, un saludo... well i would like to first greet you from ecuador i would like to greet all the participants all the people here in this event i would like to congratulate pedro my friend uh, uh, from ecuador for his brilliant discourse and for his effort for his effort for being illustrative in a very complex topic such as the financial capital and the competence with the productive capital and now with the appearance of the fictitious capital as well i share this idea that it's not so possible to have a single coin in Latin America or in South America, because this requires first a change in the political regimes of the governments in each of the government so that they can have certain consistency in their economic policies and this requires a type of government that is democratical progressist and that somehow respects human rights collective rights and the rights of workers they cannot invent a term such as labor flexibility which only wishes to reduce the rights of workers and which allows the dismissals of em employees without paying for the proper compensation as is due and obviously this also requires the management of a new way of rational use of the common goods of the natural resources as it is said we are living in south america during a time in which um, mining companies and oil companies are imposing economic policies which are really difficult to counterattack due to the weakness of the social organizations and the social movements so in these contexts which is so complex it's important for pedro to clarify the role of china in investment production productive investment, sorry, in Africa and in Latin America. These multidisciplinary way, it's combining a hegemonic capitalist system from the US 
and a soft one from China. So these relations are really significant. And Pedro, we need your clarification because we have some economic policy changes that have to underscore regional and national sovereignty. So how can we uh, face this new technology, the robotization of the of the workforce? These have been used to have cheap labor in the South and some people will be substituted or will be replaced. And finally, I would like to know some of the suggestions that might be made as to the relation with multilateral organizations such as the Monetary Fund, the World Bank, as mechanisms of intervention and not necessary help for economic development. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another friend from Brazil, uh, Beatrice. Um, yeah, please accept to. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you in such an important and interesting debate. Um, I'm really very honored to, to have the opportunity to have the floor. And I really would like uh, to, to ask uh, our uh, distinguished colleague from Ecuador, uh, who I've known his trajectory very well, his expectancy on the future of the next uh, two or three years with this uh, possibility of having Colombia again in a progressive field and the perspective we are fighting for it to have Brazil again in a democratic uh, government. That's uh, my, my question. How is from Ecuador is being analyzed the perspective in the near future for Latin America? Thank you very much. Now I will in, uh, invite Mariusiu uh, to respond, then Arindem and uh, Petro will be the last speaker to respond to uh, those questions. So uh, Mariusiu, please. Well, the questions were many and um, I do not intend to, to answer them all. I'll be also very uh, synthetic. Of course, we are concerned in putting into historical context the, the concepts or categories that were created in, in the 19th century to talk today about the current uh, conjuncture. And there are specificities, both cultural, social, and historical. That's what we have been trying to do in the Federal University of Espiritu Santo, also in collaboration with social movements. Um, we have been building historical um, collaborations with. So the issue of um, unitary currency has, uh, an import, has been an important discussion in Latin America, but some of the people have asked, and I, I don't know an effective uh, project, a concrete project regarding that we talk about trade um, a, a common uh, policies to facilitate exchange, but not a specific uh, project for currency, as we have uh, said recently. Uh, also, because if we look at the historical process of this dynamic, it should be a final step on a more long-term integration, which uh, unfortunately is not uh, already in its uh, course. So this debate has uh, made a comeback in, in the last months. And there's been talks about currency. Of course, there's a lot of debate about that. Papers uh, published have brought the, the, the idea of a single unique currency uh, also in their title. Of course, this is how media deals with it. But we do not have um, yet a 
a current structured project. What I said, Professor Pedro, is that we have seen on papers in Brazil the discussion or of a, a unique, a single currency. Of course, that process would take years, and since uh, the 20th century, we have been discussing that, uh, yet we do not have a concrete structured project. Would that be a, a trade uh, space, a uh, unified space? Or, but now uh, in Brazil, there, there have been uh, uh, talks about that. That's why I mentioned. So, about what would be the possible policies to be implemented in the case uh, of um, a new government in Brazil, this it's still being negotiated by the coalitions. These coalitions are being formed um, across the, the political parties. As far as I know, there is no um, a final uh, program being uh, shared. So we cannot talk about what will be the foreign policies, the economic policies. We still have to see that because they have not been, uh, they have, but there has not been officially uh, a program uh, published. The coalitions are uh, getting to a final point of negotiation uh, last week. And uh, so let's see what will be those proposals. This is what I had to say. There were many other questions, but this is what I'd like to highlight in the questions that I, I heard. Thank you. And uh, Petro, please go ahead. Well, I, I, I'd like to thank, to thank the, um, the interpreters in a very special way, uh, because it is clear that this is not a problem of interpretation. Because it seems that I also, after Victor Hugo's presentation, a question, uh, it seems that I need a translation from Spanish to Spanish. There is no proposal of a unique currency. The proposal is for a unitarian currency. All the rest is a, an operative, a psychological operative, either conscious or unconsciously, the people that are talking about a unique currency in America Latina are the agents of empire. Is that clear? Nobody. In the declarations signed by the presidents in 2007, including President Lula, it was written a unitarian currency. And this is not a rhetorical proposal that has been implemented in 2010. It worked for several years under the permanent bombing, the ideo ideological, technical, and financial bombing, even within the progressive governments during this time. And now, the left, of course, not all of them, but the left, even friends, mutual friends of Victor Hugo and mine are trying to jail me, are to jail all the people that were involved in this mechanism because the United States is in panic. They had raised, they had escalated the press prosecution against us at the level of the legislature, the National Assembly saying that any type of alternative means of payment is criminal, is a criminal conspiracy, is a criminal conspiracy. So what is happening among the academics, the scholars in Brazil, in Argentina, that repeating time and again a unique currency, all the situation among other politicians, even in Ecuador, that repeating a unique currency is part of the agenda. I repeat, I insist, conscious or unconsciously, but this is the agenda of empire. Even to the presidents, the uh, 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 counselors, the, 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 the advisors of, of, of our presidents have been provoking 
time and again this type of mistakes. And this is not innocent. There, there is nothing naive about this. Look, what happens? We were in conversations with people uh, with, uh, uh, within the, uh, the circles that uh, uh, animated the, the BRICS initiative in 2012. Remember, BRICS was a, a, a conception, with, was a, a joke of uh, Goldman Sachs in 2005. The uh, Chinese and Russian uh, dirigents were uh, paying the bluff uh, after the financial crisis, the financial implosion of Lehman Brothers, and more specifically, after the uh, success of the General Assembly of the United Nations and the transformation of the Chinese position from China America in 2009 and the People's Bank of China interpelling the West about their irresponsibility and corruption in, in January 2009 that provoked the issue of special drawing rights in April 2009 G20 meeting. The unique, I, this time is unique, the unique session of the G20 with some consequence, with some real consequence was precisely the use, the, the emission of special drawing rights for the first time in more than 40 years. Not because the Europeans or the Brazilian scholars or the Argentinian scholars linked to the European and American academia, but it was from the South, from Ecuador, from Bolivia, from Venezuela, that we fought for this type of situations and we forced the the IMF to issue the special drawing rights because this is a type of liquidity that cannot be linked to conditionality, to the blackmailing against our countries. The first one was in 2009 and the second one was also forced by the mobilization of, of, of some pro progressive economists all around the world in 2021 precisely to help, to help the countries to face the uh, coronavirus emergency. And our proposal is precisely to use this type of alternative mechanism, even if, com it, it, if it comes from the, uh, uh, the, the establishment like the IMF, again, again, they don't like this type of alternatives, precisely to fund options in favor of life, in the struggle between life and capital, let's bet for life with pragmatic, efficient mechanism that could solve the problems now. The Sucre, the Unitarian system of payments for Latin America were used for several months before it was uh, uh, collapsed uh, on purpose by the, uh, even by forces within the progressive governments. And it showed that it was possible without any problem to have this direct uh, uh, connection between the importers and the exporters, but also the uh, immigrants that could send uh, the transfers from, from, to the fa from, from their new countries to their families in order to have another system of payments, another type of transactions that could escape the global monopoly of the dollar the global monopoly of the Anglo-American banks. Again, this is not only, this is nothing technical. It has to do with power. It is part of a, an economic warfare against our people. It's part of our fetters. We need to break out free of our fetters precisely from these points that are the, easy, the easier ones. That are danger, they are dangerously easy. And that is why both in Latin America, but also in Europe, but also in Asia, with the Chiang Mai, Mai initiative, you have a plenty of possibilities, plenty of capabilities of transforming a, an establishment created mechanism developed under the design of the Anglo-American speculative agenda 
into a mechanism of, of delinking. And that has been very clear during this crisis. Look, the yuan, the digital yuan has been so successful, so successful that the uh, uh, tax havens in the Caribe, in the Caribbean islands, are adopting the mechanism because it, it prevents a, a lot of cost and a lot of risk going through the traditional uh, Anglo-American circuits to which they themselves are internal part. The Caribbean uh, tax havens are part of the new British Empire, which core is the city of London. And they, even they, are looking to the digital yuan as a direct option instead of the bypassing, the permanent bypassing through each bank to this network of banks and this network of tax havens, of course, offshore mechanisms, shadow banking mechanisms that had created, uh, that they are one of the main uh, uh, instruments of milking the rest of the economy. And of course, if the bourgeoisie, the segments of capital have been a, a subject of this uh, a parasiting mechanism, they are in the pecking order, they are uh, strengthening strengthen the exploitation and the domination of the working classes all around the world. So what we need to work is pragmatic, efficient mechanisms that could defend life. How can we provide resources to the indigenous communities? How can we provide resources to finance, to, 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 to deploy the initiatives, the creativity of non-capitalist forms of production? For example, in terms of food, we have plenty of possibilities there in terms of, of healthcare. So we need another type of bank for another type of development with another type of, not only another, another priorities, but also another logic, but also other type of financing. If we use the, the, the dollars in order to finance the more beautiful projects, we are feeding the monster. We need to break up, we, do, we need to, to delink from this type of, of logics with concrete options. For example, in the Bank of, of the South, in, the, in El Banco del Sur, we have specific mechanisms to promote global initiatives. That means transnational, uh, Latin American, uh, state-owned mechanisms to promote the production, the internal production of science, the internal production of health, healthcare uh, alternatives, the internal production and infrastructure for food sovereignty, the uh, promotion and the financing of uh, uh, our own knowledge the financing of the uh, uh, popular and social economy. This is, not to, is, this is not going to happen just for the rhetorics and the wishful thinking of the best thinkers in the world, the, the, the more humanistic thinkers of the world. We need to provide the actual mechanisms that could make this a reality. It is not, it is not a bad thing to, 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 to dream but we need to confront our dreams with the everyday life. This Leninist concept should be understood now in order to open the doors. Why this type of initiatives like the Sucre failed? Because the lack of political support. Right now, Latin, America, Latin, Latin American progressive national popular forces have been uh, uh, divided in a very stupid way. For example, here in Ecuador, in order denouncing, denouncing the capitalist, the progressive capitalist uh, alternative that proposed some progressive governments, they had raised a support. I'm talking about segments, of course, with very significant exceptions. Segments of the indigenous movement, segments of the traditional Marxist-Leninist left that support the neoliberal, the neoliberal agenda, the more extremist neoliberal agenda that had transformed in a few years Ecuador from a progressive alternative into a tax haven. 
a, a, a laundry uh, country, a narco state, to uh, uh, for the uh, uh, mafias in Colombia and Mexico that due to the accession to government of progressive forces cannot do what they have been doing during the last decades. So they knew they need a new place, a new a new uh, uh, plaza uh, with more financial muscle. Uh, in this case, they are putting with the support of progressive forces, they are putting the uh, oil revenues, the tax revenues of the state that are part of the international reserve, they are putting as a cash flow for the private bank, a private bank that had been uh, 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 transformed in a uh, tax haven with a, uh, the more extreme deregulation in order to attract the, in, the speculative investment from the Caribbean and Central America into Ecuador. So there is no option like a, 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 the New Deal of Roosevelt or the New Frontier of, of Kennedy uh, related to import substitution industrialization. There is no alliance for, for progress in the Anglo-American agenda. For the a, a recovery of a profitability of the Anglo-American agenda, the core of the system is fictitious capital. And the role corresponding to our periphery is the blanking, is the laundry of dirty money. So we need to transform Latin America into a new uh, uh, realm of conflict in order to sell weapons for the uh, military industrial complex, because the situation is out of hand in, in Asia and uh, uh, West uh, Euro Asia. Uh, the correlation of forces is rapidly transforming in Africa. So they need to open new uh, arc of conflicts like in, West, in, in, in Eastern Europe and now in Latin America. They had uh, deployed the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, float, the float, uh, the four uh, uh, US command that has been latent, that, ha that has been dormant since the, the 50s during the recent, recent years, precisely because the new strategic design for Latin America is this. And the second one is not production beyond the extractive uh, value chains uh, like uh, the Soya Republic uh, that, that uh, included uh, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and Bolivia. Beyond that, what they need is basically a laundry mechanism using the the financial system in Latin America. A very important segment of the left, not only the social movement, but also among the scholars and the intellectuals of the left are supporting consciously or unconsciously that agenda. What is the alternative? Look, again, this is not a matter of ideology and I'm finishing with this. This is not a matter of ideology. If we understand the internal forces of fictitious capital that has subsumed all the other layers of capital, that right now in the block of power, this is the fundamental force defining the agenda, the strategic agenda, in the current, in the actual, in the actual uh, 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 development of accumulation, fictitious capital is the most important vector of the system. We need to understand that in the context of an overproduction structural crisis is not, is not the, main, the option of, 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 of monopolic productive capital to delink from this subordination with more production. That is why the Chinese alternative of capitalism, of capitalism is unpalatable for fictitious capital. Because in the middle of an overproduction crisis, we have, we have a flood of very cheap merchandises that could not support the aspirations, the expectations of profit rates of monopolic capital. And we cannot inject more production because this is counterproductive. <laughs> Stress the redundancies. So the alternative, the alternative to the 
uh, a speculative agenda is the accumulation, the construction of infrastructure, the improvement and the democratization of technical progress because that necessarily, inexorably, is going to lead to a new correlation of forces in which the capitalist logic should be subordinated to the management of the rates of profits. It is impossible to have, to continue with, uh, that is what I was trying to show you. It is impossible to continue with the agenda. It's a suicidal situation. This is a Greek tragedy-like behavior. It's totally irrational at the, at the holistic level, but it's totally rational. This is a, a compulsory from the internal, the end of consistency of the actual dynamics of power to go th to this cliff. So in order to create an alternative, we need to put first the needs of the peoples. If people need electricity, we need to invest in electricity. People need food, we need to invest in food. People need transportation, we need to invest in transportation with all the ecological cares. This is not a matter of hands off. The ecological crisis cannot be addressed in terms of hands off. On the contrary, we need to increase our efforts, our scientific efforts in, our, in order to, to uh, 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 raise to the challenge of the, uh, of the global ecological crisis, the global energy crisis, the global demographic crisis, the global health crisis, the global health the global food crisis. And we need actual financing, not rhetorics, not good wishes. And in order to work, to build up those, those capabilities, we cannot uh, uh, rely on the power of China or the power of Russia, but on the powers, the decentralized power of a multipolar world, of the block regional arrangements that could reconstruct not only the circuits of production and distribution, but also to rearrange the correlation of forces in order to address the needs and the agenda of the peoples. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And um, now uh, it's time. Uh, we have already overrun, and I think our interpreters are very tired. But uh, thank you very much for their hard work and also patient. And then let's add up find more alternatives to financial capitalism. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.